focus of this lesson today is on the Bible. What is the Bible and what does it mean to refer to the Bible as story and the power of the biblical narrative? Now, a couple things up front. We um, need to make sure we define story. When we talk about the Bible as story, we're not talking about uh, the Bible being false or fiction. What we are talking about is that the Bible is written in a narrative form and that it's in the narrative form and the story that we hear about who God is and what God has done, how God is at work uh, in the world, and how God has uh, revealed himself. Uh, so that's going to be the focus of, of this PowerPoint here today is what is the Bible and, and what does it mean to talk about the Bible as story. Now for some of you who've had a lot of of Christian school or or Sunday school or whatever know a lot about the Bible. Some of this might be a little bit of review, but it's it's always good to have a little bit of refresher. So the first thing is, what is the Bible? Well, if you have your Bible in front of you and open up to the table of contents, you'd see that the Bible is made up of primarily two parts, um, especially in our Protestant Bibles. Uh, the first is the Old Testament. That contains these types of writings, the Torah or the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, the former prophets or the historical books. Uh, we're used to calling them the historical books, I think, in Christianity, but in, in Judaism, they refer to them as the former prophets. And these are the books of Joshua um, through Second Kings. The later prophets, which is Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then some of the smaller prophetic writings. Uh, then the wisdom writings, um, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, uh, and then some other writings, Chronicles, Psalms, um, different types of books that kind of fall under that category. And we'll look at most of them in this class. Um, there's a few, given the, our time constraints, there'll be some a few things that we won't be able to focus on. But we'll, we'll talk about these more as we go along. In the New Testament, we have... Um, the Gospels, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, we have the book of Acts. We have Paul's letters that start with Romans and go to Philemon. And then we have what are called the general epistles or letters that are written by different people like John and Peter and, and so on. And then the last book is the, the book of Revelation. Um, so how did we get the Bible? Where does the Bible come from? How did we get it in the form that we have? And it's important to realize that this the Bible as we have it kind of developed over a long period of time. Uh, so the Old Testament was pretty much kind of set early on, um, but the New Testament um, developed in the first kind of uh, four centuries or three centuries. Um, by the end of the 300s, as we'll talk about in a minute, uh, we, we have the New Testament as we, we have it. Uh, but it's important to talk about um, what we mean when we talk about scripture and canon. So scripture are basically the types of writings that we see as having authority um, or holy writings. Uh, so we have scripture, the Muslims have scripture, there's the Quran, um, Jewish people have you know the, the, the Old Testament. Uh, so our scripture is, is the Bible you know as, as we have it. Um, canon is the word that we use to talk about an official list the books that we accept as scripture or authority. So think of a canon as something that sets a boundary. Uh, it's a measuring stick uh, is really what the, the word in Greek refers to. Uh, determines what books are author have authority and what books don't. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute because there are books uh, early on, there were different canons, there were different lists um, from the first century on to the to the third um and fourth century, we see kind of different lists with different books. And so what do we make of that? And if you look around at the library or whatever, or online, you would find people saying that there's these lost books of the Bibles, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Peter, or the Cross Gospel. Um, these aren't lost. We've known about them for a long time. Um, why aren't they in our Bible? We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, then we also have what is called the Apocrypha. And in our Protestant Bibles, we tend not to have the Apocrypha in our Bibles. Um, in the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, they are included. And what that is, is what are called the intertestamental writings. Uh, these are writings that happened between the end of the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's a gap that takes place. 
The Old Testament uh, roughly comes to an end probably around 200 BC. And the first book of the, the Bible, the oldest book that we have that, that is written, is probably Paul's letter to the Thessalonians that was written in um, about 40 something AD. So what what happens in the in-between time? There's things happening. So the Apocrypha are those books that are kind of written in the in-between time. Now, the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church see them as having authority. Protestant Church, um, we kind of downplay them a little bit, but if, if any of you are Reformed and know what the Belgic Confession is, if you look at the Belgic Confession, it actually says we should be reading these books. They're not scripture, but they're important. Um, and we will in this class kind of be talking about the book of Maccabees at some point um, to kind of fill in some of the in-between in between stuff. So the history of the canon, this is a picture of Athanasius, an icon of, of uh, Athanasius. Uh, how, how do we make sense of how the canon, the New Testament canon, developed? Well, we talked about the Old Testament. That was developed rather early. There are actually two forms of the Old Testament. You have the Hebrew version, which is seen as an older version. Then you have a Greek version, which is the Septuagint. We're not going to worry about that right now. Old Testament um, really was broken into the law, the prophets, and, and the writings. We've talked about that. But what about the New Testament? Well, the New Testament develops from the first century to the fourth century. Um, and it's, it's during this time that the canon is being formed and shaped. And the books that are seen to have authority kind of are beginning to kind of uh, take, take shape. Uh, the list of books as we know it is the, is the New Testament. It doesn't come until about 380 A.D. Athanasius gives, I think, a Christmas sermon, and he lists them off and is saying, "Here's the here is the canon of the New Testament, the scriptures as we have it." All right. So how did how did the books actually get in? Well, the criteria for inclusion were number one, apostolic authority, which is is significant. Can the books be connected back to an apostle? Now, if you think about the four Gospels, if you think about Matthew and John, those are the names of apostles, but Luke and Mark are not. So how does that make sense? Well, as we look at the Gospel of Luke, what we'll see is there's a, a connection with Paul. Um, and what we'll see in Mark's Gospel is there's a deep connection with Peter. In fact, some would argue that John's or Mark's Gospel is really the Gospel of Peter. Um and so then Paul's letters and some of the other letters, there's this question of whether or not it had this apostolic authority is a big part of, of whether it's included or not. The other thing is the use in the churches. So we have to understand that the, the letters of Paul and some of these others were actually passed around in the churches and they were read. And the, the Gospels, when they are formed and shaped, they begin to be passed around to the different churches and they get read. Um, so they, they began to look at the issue of how were these letters being used and were they being used in, in the church. Uh, and then, then, of course, the common message and theme, there's an emphasis on not contradicting. So one of the questions is the book of James, which talks about works and emphasizes works versus Paul and grace and not works and so on. And we'll wrestle with that a little bit more as we get there when we get to those letters. But um, it, it's fair to say that even though they seem to contradict, there really isn't a contradiction. We'll talk about that. Now, why don't we have the Gospel of Thomas? Why don't we have the Gospel of, of Peter and, Mary, and some of these other Gospels? Well, what we, what we recognize and what was recognized early on is they would take the name of an apostle and connect it to it, even though they were parts of these communities. For example, the Gospel of Thomas is um, from a group that we would call the Gnostics or Gnosticism. And if you read through it, you would see that there's these Gnostic characteristics. So that gospel was not accepted as, as being authoritative. So there were criteria for, for including these books into the canon, which happens at the end of the, the, the fourth century. Now, it's also important, though, to realize that there was an unofficial canon. So if you think about it this way, early on... Um, there wasn't a need to necessarily say, well, which books are in and which books are out. They just used the books. They used the letters. Um, what ends up happening is it's heresy and false beliefs that, that make a community need to um, begin to say, well, what's, what's true and what's not, or what's in and what's not. So one of the things to look at is that you can go back to the early, the late first century century. 
and find that there really exists already an unofficial canon. There are already books that they're beginning to use that are, are, are uh, official. Uh, and this is the core of the New Testament. So the four Gospels, Paul's letters, um, are really being heavily used there at the end of the first century. So in, in many ways, even though they didn't make an official canon until the end of the fourth century, it's the end of the first century we already find there is this kind of unofficial canon uh, that exists. So what are the books that are in question? So the books that are really questioned, or, or not questioned, but what you would see is certain lists, early lists would include and not include. So Second Peter, Second and Third John, uh, Revelation, Jude, these are letters and books that get left off some of the early lists. And then there's a couple of books that get included that aren't never don't make the final cut. So there's this book called The Shepherd of Hermas that's included in one of the early lists. And then the, uh, the letter of First Clement, who was the Bishop of Rome after Peter, um, or, or down the line a little bit, um, he writes a letter to the Corinthian church and it makes a list and doesn't make a list, uh, make other lists. Well, ultimately, these those books don't make it in. So these are the really the, the only books that are... Um, in, in question. Now, I should say that we as Christians tend to argue that not only did the Holy Spirit have a role in the inspiration of the, the writing, but we would also want to include the canonical process that the putting together of the canon um, was, was also guided by the Holy Spirit. So whether we would, I, I wouldn't say that there aren't books that should be in that didn't make it, or there are books that made it that shouldn't have. Um, but I, th I think it's important to realize the process, and at some point, too, we'll, we'll talk about the emphasis on the incarnation, um, and that the human process by which these things get put together, God is at work, Holy Spirit is at work, but so are people, and God uses people and works through people for these processes. So when somebody tries to question Christianity because they would say, oh, look at how messy the, the canon was, um, you could actually make the other claim that the truth of Christianity is in the fact that God uses human people and human means for his purposes. Uh, and therefore, you know, we shouldn't be afraid of wrestling with these questions of the canon and so on. So one of the things I want to emphasize is the power of story. So how, as we read scripture, one of the things we're going to have to wrestle through is how we read. What are we after? Are we after facts? Um, are we after some kind of object, objective fact and truth? Or are we after some kind of narrative and reading the Bible for the narrative that gives us the meaning and understanding of, of who God is and who we are and so on? And it's important to realize the function of our imagination, not in the terms of, of like making up stuff. That's not what I mean. But we use our imagination to make connections. Um, and so the question is going to be for us how we deal with these events. So eventually we're going to read and look at David and Goliath. Is the truth of the David and Goliath story, and, and should the emphasis be on proving that it actually happened exactly the way it says? Or is the truth of the David and Goliath story actually grounded in the meaning and what the text is trying to say about what this event means. Um, now, those things are closely connected. We're not denying that there was, was uh, we're not denying the David and Goliath story. What we're asking, though, is what are we reading for and how should we read? And so I ask you to think about your own life. You tend to narrate your own experience. If I ask you, who are you? If I meet you and, and I say, well, hey, who are you? And tell me about yourself. You're going to tell a story and you're going to narrate those events in a particular way to convey a sense of, of your identity. So the questions that we're going to wrestle with, you know, what's more important, that an event happens or what that event means? How does this change the way that we think about reality and think about truth? Now, what I want to say is truth is relational. Um, and what I mean by that is it's in the relationship between the event and the meaning. So we can't get rid of, we want both, but we, we can't overemphasize one or the other. Um, it's the relationship between them that speaks to truth. That's where truth is found. And as we think about the world of the Bible and the world of our world, as we read it, what we're going to emphasize is that the truth of Scripture comes as the world of the text and the world of the reader kind of come together, right? Um, 
so again, it's it's recognizing the relationality of truth, uh, that it's in that relationship between the event that's depicted, so Jesus walking on the water or calming the storm, um, but then the meaning as it speaks to our world and as we interpret, we want to emphasize that that relationality, that truth is found in the relationship between them. So I'm trying to show this here with this um, this slide. So how does God speak to us? Well, God speaks to us in Jesus Christ. But think about how it's the relationship in Jesus of the human and divine. God is fully human. Uh, Jesus is fully human and fully divine. 100%, 100%. And it's in the relationship between the humanity and divinity of Christ that God speaks to us, the incarnation. So God comes and speaks speaks to us. So when we apply that kind of incarnational model to Scripture, we realize the relationality of Scripture. It's not a one-way thing. Um, in this way, we tend to differ from Muslims who see the Quran as something that comes down from heaven and we just got to read it and that's God's word dictated to us. That's not how Christians see Scripture. We see Scripture uh, more in an interpretive or the word that we use as hermeneutical method. And we want to emphasize the relationality of the human author and the Holy Spirit at work, right? So the authors are writing, but they're, they're actually writing, right? If you read Luke 1, the beginning of Luke's gospel, Luke writes because he thinks it's a good idea um, and he wants to make a careful account. But the Holy Spirit is involved in that. So it's both the human author and the Holy Spirit. But the same is going to go as we read that we're reading and we're interpreting and using the tools of interpretation and the Holy Spirit is at work speaking to us as we as we read the text. So emphasizing that relationality is very important. So here on this slide, I have text and reader. I have lines going to both, both of them. What I want to argue is that this method of interpretation, right, that God speaks to us right in the middle as those things come together. Right? God speaks to us through the text, but we interpret and we read the text. And not only has God inspired the, the writer of the text, but God now inspires the reader. So those of you who maybe go to church and have heard your pastor pray before he's going to read scripture and preach, right? Um, prayer of illumination. It's a recognition that the Holy Spirit has to open us up and help us to read scripture so that it, we can hear it as God's word. And God speaks in the in-between. That's the point that I wanted to make there. All right, a word about translation before we I try to give a couple of examples. Um, again, Christianity is unique in the sense that we believe in incarnation. So we believe God uses um, human language to speak to us. Now, there's nothing magical about Hebrew and Greek, um, but that's the original languages that these texts were written in. So as we think about interpreting them and, and really trying to get at what they're saying, there's a lot of emphasis um, some people will place upon the Hebrew and the Greek. So the Bibles that we have have been translated. You've had a bunch of people get together and translate it from the Hebrew and the Greek and put it into English or whatever language that you speak. Okay, so there are different types of translations. Now, it's important to realize if you've ever studied Spanish or French or whatever, there's never really a one-to-one -one correlation, right? There's always something lost in translation as we try to move from one thing to the next. And our Bibles try to help us get at, get at that a little bit. Um, but there are different types of translations. So if you look at the sliding scale, on the one, on the one side we have the literal, trying to be as literal as possible. So reading in the Greek and Hebrew and then trying to translate it literally into, into English. Now you can't do that necessarily. You have to always kind of change word order and things like that. Um, so there's really no truly literal reading or interpretation or, or translation of scripture. If you want it literal, you got to learn Greek and Hebrew. Um, but you're still translating it into English to a certain extent. Um, so when I say literal, I mean as literal as possible. And translations that try to be literal, um, as literal as possible, are the King James, the New King James, the, the New Revised Standard Version. ESV, I think you could put closer to that one as well. On the other side, you get what's called a paraphrase. So the focus isn't on being literal. It's on what is it saying? 
And so think of the message. What Eugene Peterson did in the message was he interpreted from the Greek and the Hebrew, got the literal meaning, and then translated it into, um, translated it into uh, kind of a common phrase or paraphrase. Now in the middle, what we have is what is called the dynamic equivalent. So this is the new, uh, the, the, the NIV. What they do is they try to be literal as much as possible, but on places where they can't, where it doesn't make any sense, then they'll paraphrase. So it's kind of a combination between the two. So it's important to realize some of these issues uh, with translation. Now the translation that I'm gonna use for this class is the New Revised Standard Version. Now you can use whatever one you want, since we're not together as, as a class, if you have a Bible and just want to use that one, that's totally fine. Um, but I'm going to use the New Revised Standard Version in part because of the emphasis on uh, trying to be a little bit more literal. Although, personally, my family uses the message for devotions at night because they're little kids and it's, it's a little easier uh, for them to, to understand. All right, so the David and Goliath story, I'm going to just give an example of what I'm trying to get at with the issue of event and meaning. If you could turn on your Bibles, if you have them in front of you, turn to the David and Goliath story. And it's it's in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And it's it's long. It's a long story. and it's But it's fascinating. So what happens is it begins in chapter 17 with a description of, of Goliath. Um, Right, So it talks about in verse 5, he had a helmet of bronze on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had greaves on his bronze legs. So this big, long list, the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. And he's taunting, he's taunting Israel. So you get this image of this military giant with all of the modern weapons of, of his day. And there's this big, long description of that. Then it cuts away to David, who's the youngest, the smallest, um, who's keeping sheep. And then he is sent to bring um, food to his brothers who are on the, on the front lines. And so he does this and he goes and he hears, he hears, uh, Goliath taunting. And then he decides that he will stand up and fight. Someone's got to do something. And um, so he says, goes to Saul and says, I'm going to go fight the Philistine. Um, so verse 33 says, Saul said to David, you are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him for you are just a boy. And he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father whenever a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. Um, and if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. Right, And then Saul says, look, take my armor. So Saul clothed David with armor, put a bronze helmet on his head, clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword, right? Now, it's important to get at the meaning. Remember, the, the text starts with Goliath and a description of Goliath with all of his weapons and so on. And then it goes to Saul. And then what does Saul want to do with David? Saul wants to give David all of this, these weapons and things to send him into battle. And David says, I can't use them. And then he takes his sling and he goes out to meet Goliath. Now, the, so the first thing we have to see is the text is actually giving a commentary on military strength. Remember, as we go through the Old Testament, what we're going to see is God is going to tell the Israelites, I will fight for you. Again and again, it is God who will fight for Israel. And Israel is simply called to remain faithful. So here we find in this story a, a text that wants to de-emphasize military strength. David is small. He's a shepherd. He's using a sling and stones. He's not using armor. He is not being militaristic. We can probably make the case that this is a critique of Saul. Remember, Saul was very tall. So again, the comparison between Goliath and Saul, there's an emphasis on them being very similar to each other. Um, and David is the one who is seen as, as being faithful. One other thing to really emphasize here 
right, is when he goes out to meet Goliath, verse 42, when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. So Goliath sees David and despises him because he's youthful, he's ruddy and, and handsome. And now if you look, go back to chapter 16, when David is anointed, Here's what it says. So Samuel's like, look, are these all the boys you have? Jesse says, no, I have one more. David is out keeping sheep. Samuel sends for him. Verse 12 of chapter 16 says, he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him for this is the one. So God looks at David. He's ruddy and handsome, small, and anoints him king. Goliath looks at David and sees he's ruddy and small and disdains him. So again, the text is doing more than trying to kind of give us this historical account of exactly how things happened. It's trying to tell us the meaning and significance of what's going on. So again, as you think about the relationship between the text and the event, and that it's in the, the relationship between the two, right? That we, God speaks to us. It, this is a practice of interpretation that we need to do. We need to tend to the language of the text, tend to the symbols. Um, and, and in that process, in interpreting and hearing the narrative of scripture, God is speaking to us about who God is and, and who we are as his people. Hopefully that made sense. And maybe if you have some questions, you can kind of post them online. Um, another example is in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 4. And in Mark chapter 4, we get the story of Jesus on a boat, right, out of the middle of the water. Um, and it says this, verse 37, A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat the boat, so the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. Then the wind ceased and there was dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who is this then that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, one of the things that Mark is trying to do here is connect us back to Genesis 1. Right? If you think about the chaos of the storm and the water, um, and how does, how does Jesus uh, calm the storm? Think of it this way. God, Jesus speaks and stills the storm. Now think about what God does at the beginning in Genesis 1. How does God bring order from chaos? How does God deal with the water of Genesis 1? God speaks and puts the water in its place. Now again, did Jesus actually do this? I believe that he did. But what Mark is trying to tell us is the significance of Jesus' actions. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. What Jesus does, God does. right? And so what we're getting in Mark 4 in the calming of the storm is a connection back to Genesis 1. And this, the, the creation story and where God brings order from chaos. So this is the way that we want to begin reading scripture. Um, again, wrestling with the, tr the relationality of truth and realizing that an important part of interpreting and reading scripture is the um, interpretive process. And, and realizing that God speaks to us through the words of the human author, um, but also through the Holy Spirit that grabs hold of our imagination as we hear who God is and who we are.